Hello, friends. Welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour. I'm Pastor John Lomakang, and I want to thank you for taking the time to join us for a very thought-provoking topic entitled The Faith of Jesus. Before we go into the Word, I'd like to encourage you to maybe invite your friends, and if you're watching from home, just pray for the Lord's presence to be with you. But if you're with a group of individuals, gather together now as we open God's Word to find in it the message and the courage that we need. Let's bow our heads and ask for God's guidance and for the Holy Spirit's presence. Precious Father in heaven, we put our lives in your hand and now as you become the power, the active energy, the active agent, we pray that you'll send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to speak to me and through me. And I pray that you'll bring your word to life to find fertile soil in the hearts and minds of those who are listening. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The faith of Jesus, let's catapult into the topic with a scripture in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, a very familiar scripture, but a very timely one describing, if I were to summarize the sermon, it is about what kind of faith the people of God are going to need to face the challenging times ahead of us and after we read the scripture, I will describe briefly what kind of world we're living in. Unless you've been living under a rock, you know the world is changing rapidly. But let's begin by looking at Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. John the Revelator starts with these very startling and direct words. He says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. My brethren, these times are not ordinary times. The COVID-19 climate has drastically altered the routines of our lives. Normalcy has been deleted, as it were. The world as we know it is being reconstructed to re-enslave the population of humanity. And like a frail, distracted child playing in the path of a vicious stampede, the world is asleep to its approaching destruction. If you, if you stop and pause and think about what's happening, you will discover that religious and political leaders are activating demonic measures to cripple humanity. They are devising ways to become the conscience of the world. That's why John the Revelator says the patience of the saints. In times like these, the people of God are going to need patience to make it through the atmosphere and the society that's being reconstructed as we breathe. The monetary system, the monetary leaders of the world are merging, and they are merging to snatch away the things that we have labored hard to secure. Financially, economically, politically, and religiously, the world is being barbed wire together. And I can tell you today that the intentions are anything but pure. Conventional attitudes, my friends, and, and established customs that created in us a sense of uninterrupted security have given way to pandemonium and uncertainty. That's the kind of world we're living in today, a world that's uncertain on every side, a world that does not gift us with faith and trust, a world that says to us, whatever world you came from, you're not heading to the same kind of world. It calls, once again, for the patience and the faith of the saints. You find also, just recently, the political intensity that was displayed on America's stage. Then you add to that the unyielding pandemic, challenging world leaders. Then you add to that the religious lockdown that has arrested the world, each of these independently but together are omens of a prophetic tsunami that's on the horizon of humanity. But I believe sometimes God gives disaster and turmoil permission so that it can reveal to us the kind of faith that we need. It can reveal to us the arsenal of the earth that's marshaled against us. And God is saying through these disasters and turmoil, the church has to wake up to the times in which it lives. When I think about the atmosphere that's being constructed, I believe that somewhere written in the eschatological agenda, there is a divine recommendation from heaven. And heaven is saying it's time to intensify 
the training of the saints. It's time to get the saints ready for what's coming. And I'll tell you, friends, as we were told by inspiration, the final movements that are coming together are going to be rapid ones. Wake up to the times in which we live. When I think about it, the only evidence that I can cite for these ancillary disasters are found in the often overlooked and ignored words of the Apostle Peter. We read in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, notice what Peter contributes to the times in which we live. He says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But then he adds in verse 13, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You see, the apostle Peter reminds us that exceeding joy is the finished product. Notice what he says, exceeding joy. He says, you're going through fiery trials, but don't forget, exceeding joy is the finished product. But exceeding joy is being developed amidst fiery trials and strange things. And only those that endure the fiery trials and the strange things will one day experience the finished product of exceeding joy. And I can say with certainty, 2020 has been a year of fiery trials and strange things. In the minds of so many of us, the, the phrase six feet has been heard and echoed and, and, and advertised and publicized. Six feet apart, we are told, social distancing at a time when we must be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord. 2020 has been a year of fiery trials and strange things. And that's why I say only by God's grace are we still alive today to listen to God's urgent message calling us to be ready for what lies ahead. We find in the writings of the Apostle Paul, he talks about not only what's coming, but he talks about how God is still sustaining his people in troublesome times like these. Listen to his words. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, he says, and I apply this to 2020, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, and yes, we are, but not in despair. Persecuted, but thank God not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Notice the contrast. We are hard pressed on every side, yet by God's grace we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but brethren, by God's faith in his word that we can rely on, we are not in despair. There's persecution on the left and on the right, but God has not forsaken us. And sometimes we feel struck down, but praise the Lord, we are not destroyed. Then we listen to the Apostle James as he also reveals that in this quagmire, in this vortex of a changing world, there is a method to the madness. There's a reason why God is allowing the world to be in the swirl that it's in. You notice hurricane season more active than ever before in recorded history. The, the rising crime rates in cities, people losing grip on life, many people not able to cope with the environment that they're forced to be sequestered in. Some people locked in their homes becoming voluntary prisoners because they just can't fit. They just can't make sense of how the world is changing and how it's locking us down to something that is now being termed the new normal. Even with phrases such as the political phrases, build back better, many people don't understand that those three words mean that the world is being reconstructed whether we know it or not, and we are being placed on a conveyor belt to a destiny that's outside of our control. The Apostle James says to us, there is something behind all of that. He says in James 1 and verse 4, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James is saying, be patient, because there's some place where there's still order. There's some place where there is still reliable promises that we can trust that's in the kingdom of God, that's in the word of God. While the world is crumbling in heaven, God is still in control. 
when you think about it, in the examination of God's church, God sees something in his people that are lacking. That's why I believe he allows fiery trials. That's why I believe he allows strange things. That's why with his hand on the cord, God is still holding back the winds of strife. He is saying to his people, feel the intensifying winds. It's time to not play church any longer. Feel the intense changing political climate. Feel the closing in financial markets around us. It is time to wake up and fully dedicate our lives to Christ. God is examining his church and he's wanting his people to be on target, ready for what is about to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Through the words of inspiration, God's servant Ellen White says to us in the book, Testimonies for the Church, volume 6 and page 14, she says the following words. Listen to these words. She says, events are changing to bring about the day of God, which hasteth greatly. Only a moment of time, as it were, yet remains. But while already nation is rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom, there is not now a general engagement. As yet the four winds are held until the servants of God shall be sealed in their foreheads. Then the powers of earth will marshal their forces for the last great battle. What battle is that? The battle of Armageddon. The final battle between light and darkness, between truth and error. It is being constructed today. The stage is being built. The final forces are, are coalescing together. The forces of hell and the forces of earth are looking at each other's agendas, trying to figure out what measure is best to shake the faith of God's people. But my brethren, the day that is approaching is a day when the forces of earth will meet in the final confrontation with the forces of heaven. I praise God that I can read God's word and know how it's going to end. I praise God that I can pick up the Bible and say, I don't have to guess how the story is going to wind up. I've read the back of the book and it ends with two words, Jesus wins. Now he's already won at the cross, but my brethren, the faith and the patience of the saints is needed. The faith of the saints is needed. The patience of the saints is needed to hold on. As Jesus says in Matthew 24, he that endures to the end shall be saved. These times, these present times will separate the committed from the non-committed. The church, I believe, is going through a time of sifting. You know, I'm a li I like to read books. I like to begin to add components into a message that gives us a sharpening understanding of how God sees his people. I studied that during World War II, a special grade of soldiers were being developed by NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. These were specifically des designated. They were organized. They were trained. They were equipped with the most unconventional tactics, techniques, and mode of military employment. Integrated in their training was a curriculum that was intended to develop the following areas of military exploits. They were taught about airborne operations, counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, foreign internal defenses, covert operations, direct action, that's hand-to-hand -hand combat, hostage rescue, high-valued targets, intelligence operations, which God wants his people to be intelligent, mobility operations, how to keep moving with God, but never become disconnected, and also unconventional warfare, understanding that these are unconventional times, but God still has in his armor, the armor sufficient for the days in which we live. But if you glance at those terminologies, that were used in the United States Armed Forces. You may have heard of these specialized forces. On one side, they were called the Navy SEALs, commonly known simply as SEALs. They were expertly trained to deliver highly specialized, intensely challenging warfare capabilities that were beyond the means of the standard military forces. Then on the other side, there were the Delta Forces, also known as special forces, involved in special operations. 
Now, the supreme function of these soldiers, as it were, were to defend and protect the interests of the United States of America through unconventional means. Well, the reality about both of these forces is this. Members of both units were known as, get this, quiet professionals that were notorious for being massively secretive. They were known as the ever-ready soldiers. Now, I like to dabble into military language, but when I discovered something, I discovered that in the preparation for the Battle of Armageddon, God has ever-ready soldiers. God has specialized forces. God has people that he's getting ready for unconventional warfare against the forces of darkness. And my brethren, let me say the best way to get ready for that is to study God's word. God's word is like a two-edged sword, and there's not a weapon that was ever created that could withstand the power of the two-edged sword of God's word. Specialized forces. God has ever ready soldiers. These men and women are no ordinary Christians. And their primary purpose is to defend and protect the interests of the kingdom of heaven through spiritual measures. Not military measures. Spiritual measures. What kind of spiritual measures do you mean, Pastor John? By an active prayer life. By a study life by a witnessing life, by a life dedicated to being on target, to being focused, to understand that this here and now is not all that there is, to understand that beyond the fight there's a victory, to understand beyond the valley of the shadows of death there's the kingdom of God, the house of the Lord waiting for us forever. These are soldiers that are determined not to bow to the forces that call for compromise. These men and women have a relationship that in shaking times, they remain unmoved. God is calling for ever ready soldiers. But right now, since you can't know who they are, to you, they may be quiet professionals. They may be individuals that you have not met. But God is holding them in reserve. And when all of the forces of darkness are marshaled against the forces of light, these will step to the forefront because they are being trained in Bible study, trained in their daily prayer life, trained in their devotional life, trained in their commitment to Christ. They are being trained for the most intense battle of the ages the battle that's just ahead of us. You see, friends, it's Satan's purpose to keep Christians from developing the faith of Jesus. It is Satan's highest priority to keep us unprepared for what lies ahead. It is Satan's determination to create Christians that intentionally ignore the commandments of God, hoping that they'll still be ready. But according to the passage, you've got to be obedient to be ready, to be a patient saint, to be a faith-filled saint, you also have to be an obedient saint. When I look at what's happening, I was reminded that no matter what's taking place around the world, no matter what's happening in politics in America or in Europe or in Asia or in the Caribbean or in Australia, no matter what's happening around the world, God reminds us that His purposes still will be accomplished. Look at Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10. God always has the final say. He says to us through the prophet Isaiah, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, I love this part, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasures. Whenever I read that passage, it says to me, no need to worry. No worries, as they say in Australia. No need to be concerned. God is still in charge. Amen to that. God is not able to be voted out. Nobody's going to take his seat because he sits high and looks low. He is on the throne that is eternal, but he sets men up and he brings them down. But I want to say today, it is completely beyond Satan's pay grade to prevent God's plans from being fulfilled. You may have missed that. Let me say it again. Satan is not capable. 
There's nothing that he can do to prevent the plans of God from being fulfilled. When you think about God's word, the many statements of Jesus confirm the fact that Satan cannot prevent heaven's agenda from being accomplished because God will finish what Satan has started. God will always have the last word. Let's look at some reasons why I know that. Let's go back to the time when Jesus was unjustly being interrogated. And he was standing before the high priest. And Matthew 26, 63 tells us that the high priest demanded that Jesus respond to him. He said to Jesus, if you are the Christ, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? And Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 64, listen to the words of Jesus. As he was being interrogated to confirm whether or not he is the Christ, look at what he said in Matthew 26, and verse 64. Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you hereafter, notice the next two words, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Notice the words. How do I know that Satan cannot prevent God's agenda from being accomplished? The words that Jesus said in that passage, you will, you will, meaning I may look arrested now, but the day is coming when there will be no shackles on my hand. There'll be no thorns of crown on my brow. There'll be no nails through my hand. I'm going to be free and you will see the other side of this scenario. So my brother and sister, when the days come that your faith is being challenged, when the days come that it doesn't seem like there is any end in sight or that the world is squeezing your faith out, remember that Jesus said, beyond the cross is the crown, beyond the persecution is the preparation for the celebration of the ages. Beyond his trial is a triumph. And the same is true for every one of us. But you have to hang in there. You got to pray and work and study and, and commit yourself to hold on to the faith of Jesus. Now, why does he call it the faith of Jesus? Because it's not humanly born. It is divinely born. It is a faith that does not come from having a good diet. As good as a good diet is, this faith is not developed by a good diet. It's not developed by a great exercise program, although it's good and very necessary to have a good exercise program. This is a faith that's born through the trials of Jesus, that he is willing to impart to his children to get them ready for what's ahead. I know that the Lord will come back. I know that he will finish what he promised because he said to his persecutors, you will see. But let's look at another example. Looking down to the time when Jesus will reward his saints with that eternal compensation. Listen to what he said in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 23. Look at what he says. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Look at the next two words. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Notice again, he said to his persecutors, you will. He said to those who are being faithful, I will. That is a forward-looking statement. In spite of what it looks like now, those of you in the crowded cities that are congested in traffic jams, congested, wondering how and when and if you're going to catch COVID-19. Those of you that are terrified when you see people coming that are coughing and sneezing, God is saying, hold on. It's not always going to be that way because the greatest blessing is yet to come. I will make you ruler over many things if you just simply hang in there. You also find that when Jesus was sealed in the tomb and his executioners were quite sure that he would not come out Notice what they said. This is an amazing statement. Matthew 27, verse 63. Another statement of confirmation. They said, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days, I will rise. Look at that. What a powerful statement. Sometimes your enemies will testify to the certainty of your approaching victory. They crucified Jesus, but they could, not, they could not dismiss the possibility that he's not in there permanently. He's going to come out somehow, some way or another. 
He said he will rise again. And I want to tell you today, we know that what Jesus said is true. He ever lives to make intercession for you and me. He did rise again. Praise God. And he is our intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary. But notice the two words that we continue to see coming back. You will. I will. I will. The certainty that what Jesus started, he will finish. One more example. Finally, when Jesus successfully rose from the tomb on the third day and he was preparing to ascend to heaven, his words once again confirmed Satan's inability to prevent heaven's agenda from being fulfilled. Look at John chapter 14 and verse 3. The words, the, the forward-looking words of the promises of Jesus, he said to his disciples, and if I go and prepare a place for you, here it is again, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Notice, you will, I will, I will, I will continuously. What are we saying? The Lord is saying, when he makes a statement, I will, that is a forward-looking statement. He is saying, regardless of the fact that I'm leaving, I will come again. Regardless of my persecution, I will rise again. Regardless of my accusations, I am the Son of God, and you will see me coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You see, brethren, those with the faith of Jesus are not looking for some new political uh, agenda that's being surmised or created by earthly powers. We put our faith and trust in the unwavering Word of God. I know that we just came through an election that just caused some people's face to twist and their hearts to stutter. Some people got rashly angry on one side and people were bewildered on the other. People were putting their hope in one man or the other. But I want to tell you today, I put my hope in nobody but Jesus Christ. I put my hope in nobody but the one who has never lost. Why? He says to me, make your calling and your election sure. The only election that the saints need to be concerned about is making sure that they are a part of the election of grace. That when the time comes, you must know that Jesus Christ has cast a vote in favor of having you in his kingdom eternally. That is the election that causes you to embrace the faith of Jesus. So friends, today we stand on the unstoppable declaration of Jesus. And what is that? I will come again. I will rise again. Praise God for that. But the Apostle Paul he could not keep himself outside of this scenario. Notice what he says in Philippians 1 and verse 6. He also contributes to the faith of Jesus. He says, my brethren, Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, notice a forward-looking word again, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Oh, I love that phrase. You see, sometimes we don't look like Christ. Some days we don't sound like Christ. Some days we don't behave like Christians. Some days we don't talk like Christians or maybe do things as a Christian should. But the Lord is saying, I'm not done with you yet. The work that I began in you, I will complete it because I've got a day of completion that I focused on. It's called the day of Jesus Christ. As the Apostle John says, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we do know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. I want to tell you, even as a pastor, those words encourage my heart because no matter how many sermons I preach, I can't preach my way into the kingdom. I've got to get in under the grace of Christ. I too must hold on to the faith of Jesus. I cannot rely on the things of earth. I too must walk the same path that you walk with the patience and the faith of the saints. But I too must be obedient to the commandments of God because they are not separated from patience and faith connected to the saints of God in the last days. The Apostle Paul continues to remind us that the work that Christ has started will be completed. Look at Romans 9 and verse 28. Romans 9 and verse 28. He says to us today, For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. I read that passage and I said, Thank you, Lord. 
I couldn't take 200 more years of this stuff, even though I can't live for 200. How much more can you take, my brother? How much more can you take, my sister? Find your comfort in the words of the Apostle Paul, the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. It's going to get rough, but the roughness is going to be short. The joy is going to be permanent. The joy, the blessings are going to be eternal. The rescue from this planet in rebellion is going to be forever and forever. God's going to finish the work that he began. He's going to cut it short for righteousness sake, and the Lord is going to make a short work upon the earth. That's why, friends, the faith that resides in Jesus will also reside in his end times people. Only the faith of Jesus can sustain us up to and through the final conflict. How do I know that? There are a lot of people that have doctrinal integrity. But let me make it very clear today. Doctrinal integrity is not enough to sustain us. We are not sustained by academic attainments. We are not sustained by intellectual stimulation. We are saved by spiritual transformation. And that only comes through the faith of Jesus. How does that happen? Colossians 1 verse 27 gives us a glimpse into how spiritual transformation can get us ready for the days that lie ahead. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians 1 verse 27, speaking about the saints, he said, to them, notice the two words, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is it? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I love that. Not money in the bank is our hope of glory. Not a stable paid off real estate lot. Not a solid education or possessions that we don't even have the ability to keep track of. What is it? Christ in us is the hope of glory. Christ in your life. Christ in your daily life, Christ in your thoughts, Christ in your actions, Christ in the transformation of your character. And I know that we are not yet where God knows we're going to be, but praise the Lord, we are not where we used to be. The faith of Jesus is unrelenting. It's looking into the nooks and crannies of our thoughts and lives and actions, into our words and deeds and saying that we still need to be chiseled. We still need to be sanded down. We still need to get ready to one day look like Jesus. In the book, Desire of Ages, page 677, paragraph 1, notice these encouraging words. We are told, the life of Christ in you produces the same fruit as in him. Living in Christ, adhering to Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ, you bear fruit after the similitude of Christ. Notice, notice that statement, adhering to Christ, living in Christ, supported by Christ, drawing nourishment from Christ. If Christ is your source, it is impossible to have fruits that's different from Christ. If you are connected to Jesus, it's impossible to be anything but like Jesus. That's where the faith of Jesus is formed. The faith of Jesus is not formed in ease. It was chiseled through unjust accusations. Jesus became pure through the furnace of affliction. And the reality is, some of us are going to have to go through the furnace of affliction. But don't fear the fire. Just pray that on the other side you come out like purified gold. As one writer said, the refiner's fire has now become my soul's desire. And God has said he's going to purify his church. He's going to purify us in the furnace of affliction. Not that he wants to burn us up, but he wants to ignite our lights. He wants to clean us up. He wants to remove from us every sense of impurity, getting ready to exhibit to the world the faith of Jesus. That's why on the heels of the most urgent messages to humanity, the three angels' messages. Revelation paints a vivid picture of those that stand on the podium of the victory. Those that gain victory over the mark of the beast, over his name, over his number. Those that gain the victory over everything that Satan has thrown their way. How do they gain the victory? Because they have on the whole armor of God. 
How do they gain the victory? Not because they fought their way through, but they put themselves in the presence of Christ. And every battle that the saint go through, the battle belongs to the Lord. But when we stand on the podium of the final victory, you will find standing there those that are resolute in a vacillating society. Today, they are a vivid representation in a vacillating society. They are a vivid representation of those that are sold out to Jesus Christ. They are categorically and undeniably soldiers of an eternal kingdom, unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, unapologetic for the truth as it is in Jesus Christ, undaunted by the heckling of Satan's fiercest allies. One day, friends, reverberating through limitless space and time, you'll find a description of God's elite soldiers covered by the faith of Jesus. Come with me. Let's peek behind the curtain and see how the Bible introduces them. Revelation chapter 14, we find verse 4 and 5, gives us a description of God's elite soldiers. These are the ones who are not defiled with women. For the Bible says, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits of God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. What does all that mean? What does that mean? These are the ones, heaven's quiet professionals that are quiet no longer. Their lives and their lips reveal and proclaim the faith of Jesus to a crumbling world. You know what, friends? I want to be in that group. I want to be a part of those when the world is looking for light that they can turn to my life and see that God's light is shining through my actions, that God's light is shining through the way I live, through the things I say, through the way that I exemplify myself in a shaking society, that I will remain unmoved in an unstable world, no longer quiet, but looking for opportunities to proclaim goodness to the Lord. Recently, I was on the elevator in a town, I won't tell you exactly where, but I was going to meet my wife who was uh, getting her hair done. And as I entered the elevator, there was a young lady on the elevator and I was singing a song in preparation for my sermon that night. But I was singing, I guess, a little loudly and people that were waiting in the foyer for the elevator heard it. And when she stepped on the elevator, she says, was that you singing? And I caught myself. I thought I had gotten to the ground floor, but I had just gotten to one floor below where I was standing. And she said, that was a lovely song. What song was that? And I said, well, it's a song I wrote entitled Never Alone. And tonight I'm going to be talking to young people, encouraging them to give their lives to Jesus. And she looked at me and I had my glasses on. She said, oh, the moment I looked at you, I realized I forgot my glasses. And when she turned, I saw printed on her mask, on her COVID mask, Church of Satan on her mask. And I said, does it say Gnostic Church of Satan on your mask? She said, yes. She says, I'm a member of the Church of Satan. And immediately in my mind, I said, boom, witnessing opportunity, witnessing opportunity. And I said to her, how can I find out more about what that means? And she said, you want to find out? I said, well, how can I find out? Well, we made it to the ground floor. And I said, what's your email? I got her email. What's your name? I got her name. And I spoke to the local pastor, a good friend of mine, Pastor John Stanton. And I said, I got an email for you and I got a name. I believe that that young lady became a member of the Church of Satan because she had never had an encounter with the man called Jesus. You see, friends, in the last days, God does not need quiet soldiers. God is not looking for quiet professionals. God is looking for those that are willing to speak up and to, to speak up for the kingdom of God, to know that in this war, in this final battle, there are those that still need to be rescued. Satan is trying to claim precious lives. And God is saying, let my faith in your life mean something. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. What does it mean when it says they were not defiled with women? That means they were not corrupted by false doctrines. They were not corrupted by those who aim for popularity and financial gain. They were a part of the remnant. 
they take their stand with a message that infuriates and frustrates Satan's dark kingdom. That's why they are virgins, undefiled. The Bible says they were not defiled with women, but it also says for they are virgins. What does that mean? They are true to one man alone. They remain loyal to no one other than the man Christ Jesus. They are impenetrable. They have on armor that cannot be broken through. Why? Because the faith of Jesus is their shield. They are virgins, meaning they have been undefiled. They listen to a thus saith the Lord. They trust God's word and God's word alone. Their minds are not a dumping ground for philosophy and ideologies that conflict with a thus saith the Lord. But to understand what's ahead, we've got to look at what's behind us. You see, the faith of Jesus is the ingredient that separates failure in our past from success in our present and in our future. But how do we get that success? Where do we find that success? How does that success lead us to develop the faith of Jesus? Notice the words of the Apostle John in 1 John 5 and verse 4. Notice what he says. For whoever is born of God, John says, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Wow, did you get that? The victory that overcomes the world, simply two words, our faith. I've been talking about the faith of Jesus, but how does the faith of Jesus become our faith? Simply put, we become his children. If he's our father and we're his children, we become instant inheritors of what rightfully belongs to Christ. We become instant inheritors of his righteousness. So therefore, his faith now removes our faith. Our faith is, is replaced by his faith. And that is an overcoming faith because those in the hall of faith were members of these special forces. When you read the Bible, you'll discover that throughout the ages, from the beginning of time to the present, there are those that chose not to be sold out. There are those that said, regardless of the call of the wild, regardless of the call of the enemy, regardless of the agenda of society, I'm going to stand firmly. And heaven introduces these unvacillating soldiers in a single statement in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Let's look at verse 1. The hall of faith, the members of the special forces, the faith of Jesus. The Bible says, who are they? Now faith, Hebrews 11, 1, is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let me make it very clear, my brothers and sisters. Faith is not developed in the checkout line. It is developed by daily training your mind in God's word. As Romans 10 verse 17 says, look at what it says. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You cannot have faith without studying God's word. You cannot be ready for what's coming unless your mind is being molded by a plain, thus saith the Lord. And finally, when everything else around us is failing, only the authenticity of God's word, the veracity of God's word, the surety of God's word, will sustain us through the trials and the battles just ahead of us. In Great Controversy, 1888 edition, page 593, paragraph 2, listen to what Ellen White says. She says, notice, none but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Notice she says, none but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Notice what she didn't say. She didn't say none but those who own a Bible. No, you can have a box of cereal and starve to death if you don't eat it. You can have nutritious food surrounding you and die emaciated because you refuse to allow your body to be affected by ingesting that which will give you strength. What am I saying? When God's word is studied, you begin to develop a faith and a walk with God that will not be developed any other way. That's why the book of Hebrews is the hall of faith. It talks about those whose faith carried them through the most trying times. Now, why do I think that's important? Because there were difficulties in the past. When we look at the determination of their faith, we find courage for those things that are yet ahead of us. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 to 40. What a powerful retinue of those who stood firmly and they had the faith of Jesus. The Bible says, 
what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lion, verse 34, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Verse 35, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Why? That they might obtain a better resurrection. But it keeps going. Verse 36, still others had trials of mockings and scourging. Yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted and slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And finally, verse 39, and all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. And look at verse 40. God, having promised something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What a list. What a list of people that went through stuff. Now get this. If they can go through that and wait for a better resurrection, my brethren, you haven't seen anything yet. You haven't been sawn in two. You haven't been imprisoned in chains and stoned and, 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 and walking around in goat skins and destitute. We haven't seen anything yet. But God is saying, if you can look back and find soldiers that endured the things of the past, oh, my brother, the same God they trusted in is the same God you can trust in. The same one that gave them strength to hang on is the same Christ that could give you strength to hang on today. What kind of faith did they have? A faith that looked beyond the trial to the triumph. A faith that looked beyond the persecution to the preparation of the celebration. A faith that refused to lay down. They stood up in spite of what could happen to their lives. But in the closing scenes of the kingdom, Jesus is looking for that group once again. Those that refuse to turn back in the face of sacrifice and challenge. Those that know that beyond the valley of shadows awaits the house of the Lord, where we will have joys forevermore. Those that realize that hardship is a short season, but heavenly joy is eternal. Praise God for that. I'm looking forward to those days. I'm looking forward to the greater thing that's on the horizon. I'm telling you today, yes, there's COVID-19. Yes, there is instability in the economy. Yes, in the minds of some, they still don't know who the next president is. But I want to tell you today, I know who's on the throne of the kingdom of God. I know who's interceding for me today, and he is, his name will never change. He is the only victorious one that I need to remain connected to. And I find these words in a very inspired text from Ellen White. She says in the book Bible Training School, March 1, 1909, paragraph 3. Listen to what she says. Paragraph 3. She says, I am sure Satan with his hellish agencies is striving his best to dishearten and discourage, but we must not be discouraged. Neither must we fail. We must suffer loss and be spoken against and have false witness born against us and take it patiently for Christ's sake. One thing is sure, she says, God is true. Amen for that. We may lean heavily upon him and we shall not become confused amid the babble of voices. We must put on armor and keep it on. Then what? Fight manfully, she says, the battles of the Lord. And having done all, I love this, stand ready for another conflict. We must keep in harmony, taking the whole armor of God. We must have increased faith and move forward carrying this banner of truth. And what is it? The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Boy, that's a mouthful, but I hope you didn't miss it. What we are being told is these are not ordinary times. These times call for a faith far beyond ordinary faith. 
These times call for the calibration of our mission, for the sharpening of our vision, for the recommitment to an agenda that will never fail. These are not ordinary times, but neither is Jesus an ordinary God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we think about Christ, we can say, in Christ alone, I place my trust. In Christ alone, I have that blessed assurance. No other one but Jesus. Friends, the day is coming when we are going to be able to stand before Christ and say, thank you for fighting the battle for me. I'm going to invite Tim to come, and I'm going to invite Ryan to come. And as you're listening to the song, In Christ Alone, I pray today that you'll be thinking, what can I do? How can I find my anchor in the faith of Jesus? How can the Spirit of God move me to be obedient to the cross of Christ? In Christ alone, that's the only place that we will find the victory that is awaiting us. Listen to the words of the song. And after the song, I'm going to have an appeal for you. Stay by. I want you to know that before this broadcast is done, there's something today that you must do. Listen to the words of the song, In Christ Alone. Christ alone will I glory Though I could pride myself in battles won For I've been blessed beyond measure by His strength alone I overcome Oh, I could stop and count successes Like diamonds in my hand But those trophies could not equal To the grace by which I stand In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. Christ alone will I glory, for only by His grace I am redeemed. Only His tender mercy could reach beyond my weakness to my need. Now I seek no greater honor than just to know Him more and to count my gains and losses to the glory of my Lord. In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said. My source of hope is Christ alone. My source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. Amen. What a powerful testimony. In Christ alone, my brothers and sisters. 
Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Tim. That's our declaration. How are you going to have the faith of Jesus? The answer was in the song. The answer was in the message. In Christ alone. I want to say that again, because in this nation that's still split on so many levels, it has even affected the church where people in the environment that has shaped the way that society thinks has poured also into the minds of many of our church attending members. They've lost their compass. They are angry, they're frustrated because they have forgotten that there's only one agenda that we must remain true to. That's the agenda of Christ, the unchanging word of God. It's time to put down politics. It's time to put down the things of the world that are designed to do nothing but distract us and give our hearts and minds to Christ again. It's time to be a people of reconciliation, to not be a person on the left or a person on the right, but to recognize that on the wings of the eagles, both wings are needed for us to soar on the glory of the righteousness of Jesus. I was listening recently about an article that one pastor said, I'm a purple pastor, the Christian color purple, a purple pastor preaching to blue Christians and red Christians. He says, what can I do? And the thought came to my mind. Well, if the color of Christianity is purple and the color of one party is blue and the color of the other party is red, if you merge blue and red together, you get the color purple. What am I saying? My brothers and sisters abandon the left and the right and stand with the man in the middle. His name is Jesus. These are not ordinary times, but we don't serve an ordinary God. And Revelation 14, 12 reminds us once again, when it is all over and it's all said and done, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. May you pray for the faith of Jesus and do your part that when Jesus comes, you will be in the armor of none other than the faith of Jesus. God bless you.